Come on, people. Good morning. Let's do it like we do it at the store. I know you all do this in your sales meetings. Every store in America does it all at once. I'm going to say good morning. You're going to respond real loud. I want to hear some breath being expelled. Good morning. Good morning. Much better. Much better. Love it. All right. I started off in the, in the small room, and uh, I'm not going to not repeat myself too much, but basically uh, in the spring of 05, I was uh, very happily employed at Reynolds Consulting Services. I'd put together some deals with Mercedes, Ford, Honda, a few other car companies, and uh, to the point where Reynolds set me up with an office on the West Coast, I said, let me focus on Honda, Toyota, and Nissan, uh, and I was just digging it, loving life. We're helping them install internet departments, uh, influencing their, the way they route leads to the dealers, the way they get leads, their marketing efforts, uh, just having a blast, doing what I've been, you know, around the car business, what I've been doing since 1981, and feeling like I was making a difference. There was a Chevy store in Toronto, Canada, Dean Myers Chevrolet, don't know if we have any Canadians in the room, but um, I had worked with Dean Myers, and Dean Myers had asked me to go visit uh, Bill Gruwell, uh, the, the guy, that guy right there in the, white, in the white shirt in that group photo right there, and his two sons. So I, I was commuting between Albuquerque and LAX, so I would take, uh, do a three-hour connection through Phoenix, take a cab over to the store, because I had that much respect for Richard Chamberlain, the dealer principal at Dean Myers. And once I met Bill and his sons, I was fascinated by their dealership. And what I'm going to show you today is what initially caught my interest. But more importantly than that was um, being a car guy, let's face it, what we do is we capitalize on what's important to people, right? When you're selling a car, what do you focus on? What's important? To that customer. So I saw an opportunity to build what I envisioned as being the ultimate e-business department, made up of a business development center. Um, as Jerry and Brian and a couple, uh, Ken, a couple of people in the room know, um, it's hard to say sometimes certain things without sounding like you're bragging, but I've set up a couple of BDCs, to put it mildly. These guys know it. Jerry, fair to say? I'm talking about it in the hundreds and internet sales department. So I had, I, but the thing that always bothered me was the compromises that were made along the way. It seemed like every time there was compromises that would dilute the effectiveness of what I was trying to build because every dealer had constraints. Might be space, might be small market, whatever. These guys are in a market of four million people that is one of the few major metro markets that has not been over-dealered. So they're, they're if you look at the list of the top 40 Chevrolet stores in America, 10 on that list are in Phoenix. There's 13 Chevy stores in Phoenix Metro, what we call the LMG, the local marketing group for Chevrolet. 10 of them are on that top 40 list every month. So it's, it's uh, and Chevrolet has the number one market share in that, in that market for the brand. So I'm looking at all these factors, and besides the fact that they, quite honestly, they offered me double what I was making at Reynolds, and so it was kind of, you know, my wife's going, you mean you won't have to travel anymore? You work at a dealership, you're going to make twice as much money, and they're going to treat you, you know, like a human being? And I said, yeah, and she goes, you're not thinking about turning it down. And of course, I accepted it, so I came on board. Um, I, I wanted to put some pictures on here, because I wanted to draw your attention. Every single person in these pictures I brought into the organization, except that, that management shot up there. What's really interesting is this was taken in September of 05. All those managers in that upper right photo, they're all still there today. Every single one of them. They haven't lost one of those people. And that's basically the sales management team. Gives you an idea of the stability. Down here I've got, uh, th this was a group of internet sales specialists. Since I started this guy right here, we, we promoted him into a uh, a management role from a sales role help, and then he's built his own team, and that's uh, become a, a whole separate profit center in itself. Um, these two guys right here on the on the moped and the electric scooter, um, they're they're not gay. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but they're both married with children, very hetero. hetero. Um, Joel Matson is my BDC manager. Joe Matson was there when I got there, but he's, he's like the Doogie Hauser of the car business. When I got there, he was 21 years old. He'd been working there since he was 19. 
And the kid, the kid is unbelievable. He's unbelievable, his mind, the way he works. He now supervises a BDC with 27 people working for him. The guy in the back of the moped is George Salmon. He was, uh, he was a closer out on the floor. And when I got to know uh, the people out on the floor, I, I tapped on George's shoulder one day and I said, George, you need to get into the internet. He's, he looked at me and he goes, what? I go, you need to get involved with the internet. He goes, why? I go, because that's the way the business is going in the future. He knew nothing about the internet, did not know how to do email, open up a computer, but we promoted him to the internet sales manager of the new car team, and he's done a phenomenal job. Like I said, we sold over 4,000 cars last year. Um, down here, this is uh, Scott Daly. He's, I only need one picture because there's two identical clones. They're literally identical twins, him and his brother. I tapped into them, saw them on the floor, brought them back to the business department, and we created what we called the e-finance team. And we'll get, we'll get into that as well. Uh, this young lady right here is Kelly Slaughter. Uh, Kelly is one of two CRM administrators. They're basically my assistants. And uh, which kind of goes to how great it is working for the Gruwells. If you can build a financial model around something, they let you do it. Uh, basically, I found that we were spending about 8,000 a month in outsourced direct mail services and some other things. I, I found out that in our DMS, we could do those in-house. I was able to get, you know, cut that $8,000 expense, hire two CRM administrators, and the work that they replaced on the outsourcing takes them about, each of them, maybe eight hours a week. So, you know, now I've got two full-time assistants that are paid for with an additional 30, 35 hours a week to do things like preparing reports, uh, reconciling, uh, lead statements, you know, to get credits for invalid and duplicate leads, that sort of thing. Tracking the showroom traffic, uh, doing so many things that if I had to do them myself, I'd have no time to, you know, focus on people development, which has been, the technology stuff is fun, the people development has been really the essence of, of the work or the bulk of my time since I've been there. Um, I wanted to play this video. Organizational development in my opinion, and I'll tell you when something's a fact and when it's my opinion, in my opinion, organizational development is the single greatest challenge facing dealers today. What I mean by organizational development, I mean getting the right people into place at the dealership. You know, we, in, at events like this, we spend a lot of time looking at different vendors supplying similar solutions and, and just, you know, all concerned over, oh, do I go with this guy, do I do that, or... Do I do this? Do I do search engine marketing? Do I outsource it to it in-house? Do I buy ads? Do I buy leads? We agonize over all these decisions, and they really pale in comparison to the significance of attracting, recruiting, attracting, hiring, bringing on board the right people into the organization. For those of you who are in a hire, if, that are hiring managers, the most important job you do at the dealership is make the decision to pull the trigger and hire somebody. Um, Ken, uh, where's Ken? Ken? Ken said something when we were walking over from the room. He goes, you know what, Ralph? He goes, in my experience, how'd you put it, Ken? The right people attract, or good people attract good people. Bad people attract bad people. And that's, I can't remember hearing that before. It's kind of intuitive. I think we all know it. But that, that in a nutshell, is the, the, the guiding, overriding principle at Courtesy Chevrolet that comes right from the owners. To them, the most important thing in the world is to get the right people into their dealership. And where they end up and what they do is really secondary to getting the right people in the first place. And for 50 years, the store has steadily grown. How many GM dealers, our, our new car sales were up 10% in 06 over 05. And that's certainly bucking the national trend. We, we never broke 9,000 units before. Last year, we retailed 11,000 units. Single point Chevy store retailing 11,000 vehicles a year, over 7,700 new Chevys. They didn't do it because they sell them cheaper. They didn't do it with the facilities. Believe me, it's the first time I pulled up, I thought, what a dump. But Because uh, what they do is they just keep buying like strip malls next door and stuff, and then they knock down walls, and you got yourself a used car department. Um, they want, <laughs> I'm, I'm, my office is in a building that went up in 1957, and, I've, and like I said earlier, I've still got uh, Mrs. Fitzgerald's two giant marlin that she caught in the, late, in the early 60s. They're on my wall. I wanted to take them down once. Everybody's, oh, don't mess with the fish. 
That's Mrs. Fitzgerald's fish. Um, anyway, one of the, a couple of things we've done is we've really, we, besides using the internet to sell cars, we've used the internet to, um, to attract people and grow our organization. We do things like each of the teams that we create, we create a logo that we use for their email signatures, for letterhead, for ads we put online. And, and the group wells invented this long, probably long before, well, I can't say before I was born, but certainly before I got there. And so I, mean, I don't want to take credit for this, but basically their success is they, they take a couple of people and they break them off as an independent team. They give them all the resources to sell, 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 higher, higher, higher. And as the team grows, it reaches a certain critical mass, and then the team gets split into two teams. I call it organic growth. Because it, what it reminds me of is, it reminds me of, uh, uh, you know, when, uh, when an egg is fertilized, and it, the cells grow, and they split, and then the ones that split grow, and pretty soon you've got a human being going on. Um, that's what, that's ba the basis of their success. So, um, I know, do we have, do we, by any chance, do we have sound uh, the, from the, uh, the media people? Do we have the ability to hook up uh, speakers or sound? No, you know what, I got a microphone right here, we'll just play it. Hopefully this mic is on. Not saying it's the best video in the world, but basically we created this video, and all our online ads have the video in the ad, you know, just like we've talked about using video to sell cars. We said, well, what's more important than selling a car? Hiring a good person. So we wanted to project an image of uh, being uh, cutting edge, you know, a little more advanced, especially because the minute they pull into the facilities, they look up and they go, oh my God. You know, until they get inside, because inside we've, we've thoroughly modernized. So we really, want, we really felt it was important for our image. This is, uh, this is just a screenshot. There's a, you have monster.com, career, careerbuilders.com, so on and so forth. Uh, this is jobbing.com. It's pretty regional. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's very effective for us. I think it's good in Denver and, and uh, Phoenix and Las Vegas. But most, I, I've been able to attract a uh, a large quantity of people in the last year and a half using online ads. Um, at, for example, right now we're trying to recruit a CFO. We have had an ad that runs an automotive news. But for most other positions, we, we run it with an online. In fact, we have a contract where we have five, the ability to run five ads. And unless the other departments use it up, for example, right now I have this ad listed in three versions. But you're allowed to target three segments out of, say, 28 segments. So I, each of the ads is targeted to three different job categories, so I can get the most exposure online. I probably look at 150 resumes a month off of this, jobbing.com. So for those of you, again, that are in a, in a position to hire or grow your department, I gotta tell you, we've tried print, it's worthless anymore. We don't waste any money on, on you know, newspapers for help wanted anymore. We do it all online. Uh, that's where it's at. It's, Excuse me? Yes, we're on an annual contract, so that gets our cost down to a fairly manageable level. And they usually charge extra if you want the ability to search resumes that are on file. Um, what we do with that is when I need it, I buy it on a month-by-month -month basis. If I don't need it, I turn it off, because it's like $199 a month to be able to search resumes. But uh, it, which brings me to a point, as proud as I am of the ad, and then the video is off to the right there, the best people I found, they didn't apply to us. I found their resumes online, and then basically treated them like a lead. Hi, so what are you looking for in your next car, I mean job? Um, and, and, and that's how we work it, and to the point where I've even used our BDC to call people, you know, call and call and call when I'm leaving, when I got answer machines, till I get a hold of them, and their goal is to set an appointment to come in for an interview instead of an appointment for a test drive. Um, but that's how aggressive we are at trying to find good people. Now, the, uh, this is, I, li I like to show this because basically what's happened as a result, and a lot of people come and visit us, Ed Peeper, Brent Dewar from General Motors will come down and say, how do you guys do it? Because we, we, we want other dealers to do it. 
A lot of people focus on what we do from the marketing side. The marketing and the people development, and this is a different philosophy than I had before I took on this job two years ago, they go hand in hand. I used to come from the school of thought that said, you had to have your people and your process and your technology in place before you turn on the marketing and start getting customers. Otherwise, it's like having that big sale on the weekend and nobody out front to take the ups. What's, what I've learned in the last two years is with e-business, there's a little different twist on this. What we, here's what happens. In order to grow the people, I need offices, workstations. All the ones we got right now are occupied. I go to my IT director. He says, you know, you fill out a requisition, go get it signed off by the dealer. I go to uh, Bill, and Bill says to me, he goes, so who's going to use these computers? Well, I don't have them yet. I haven't hired them yet, Bill. Well, don't you think you should hire them before you start buying, you know, knocking down walls, building offices, and putting up cubicles, and buying computers and stuff? You're probably right, sir. So you go back to the drawing board, you go to hire people, and what if anybody that's experienced in internet sales, what are they going to say? How many leads? The place I'm at right now, I get 70 leads a month, and yeah, I'm selling 10 or 12 cars, but I know I could sell more because I got extra time. I, you know, I just need more leads. So your lead volume becomes a huge tool in attracting talent. And so at a certain point, it dawned on me that uh, a different strategy might be to literally choke the store with an excessive number of leads to the point where people go into panic management mode and we start knocking down walls, putting up office space, hiring people that maybe never sold cars before, focusing on training on them because every 10 minutes there's another dozen leads or whatever. Um, and that's why I wanted to show this. In the, since August of 05, these were the unique visitors, like a lot of stores, it was like three or 4,000 unique visitors. So we started to get going, and we did a lot of different things. We used ClickMotive, BZ Results, AZ Central. We started building websites every month, microsites, Spanish language sites. General Motors endorsed Cobalt. Never wanted to buy a Cobalt website, but hey, my hat's off to them. They got the endorsement from GM. If I wanted a link from Chevrolet.com to, you know, to, my, to a website, it had to be a Cobalt website. So I basically you know, said, I want the bare bones minimum, 360 a month, signed up for it. Very profitable, because we you know, sell probably five, six, seven cars a month off the site for 360. I'm OK with that. It's a good ROI. But if you'll notice, this yellow section right here was the search, the search-driven microsites. We started finding out that there, were, there was, uh, has anybody ever heard this phrase, how do you generate leads? Anybody ever hear that? See, I believe we don't, at the dealer level, generate leads. I believe the manufacturers generate leads with a lot of their marketing efforts and coming up with good product and whatnot. As a dealer, the leads are out there floating around in cyberspace. Our job is to, to capture them. But they're there. It's like, does a hunter create deer? No. The hunter goes out and hunts the deer that are there. So that's with, with leads, what we've learned is in a market like our size with 4 million people, there's a lot of people out there that'll consider a Chevy. A lot of them. You know, we got some new products. They're great products. Um, if I can get those people to show interest in the form of a lead, I've got more leads. I choke the system. Everybody, the whole management team, and they're, they're some of the best managers I've ever worked with in my life, and when they need to get something done, they get it done. When they see the store just drowning in leads, they find people. They pull them out of other stores. They make calls. They hire family members. They do what it takes. So that was a big part of the fuel to the fire. Of, otherwise, everybody stands around and goes, we need more people. We need better people. You know anybody? No? I don't know anybody. What are we going to do? We need more people. So everybody's going to solve problems differently. We're all creative problem solvers. This is, this is what I did. I basically over, I flooded our system with leads to where everybody, including the owners, got involved in recruiting and hiring. Uh, last year, we generated a uh, little over 61,000 leads. These are the breakdowns on the leads. These are the, the volume, the sales, where the sales came from, 4,008 e-business department sales. Uh, 
that were made possible by our, hi our recruiting and hiring. Strategy, little strategy worksheet, basically it started off on a legal pad. The organization, the, the, the lead management process, how many of you struggle with lead management process on the execution side? Anybody here, do you, do you ever find yourself where just getting it done becomes a challenge? I'm here to tell you, if you want to get it done, you've got to have the right people in place. Show them how to do it. It's not real complicated, is it? It's actually sort of simple, even if, even if we try to make it look complicated. Any car guy can go through this and say, phone call, email, phone call, email. I know how to do that. The hardest part is having enough of the right people that are willing to execute on a daily basis repetitious tasks over and over and fail 80% of the time and still come to work the next day with a good attitude. Think about it. If you're one of the best internet salespeople on the planet, whatever you do is going to fail 80%. Eight out of ten times it won't work. And yet you're asked to keep doing it. Doesn't that sound sort of like the definition of insanity? Our perspective is if you don't do it right, you sell five out of 100. If you do it really well, you sell 20. If you, if you do it sort of mediocre, you'll sell 10 cars out of 100 leads. And that's all we're looking for because we know how to get the leads. That and the people. The people are the, the critical element. So I, what I wanted to share with you is this concept of organic growth. I was talking about the organism that it grows in size and then it splits into two. We've done that several times. We now have eight internet sales teams and BDC teams. We have our new Chevrolet BDC, our used car BDC, our parts department BDC. We do a couple million dollars a month in wholesale parts. They got a BDC with eight people. All they do is call for orders on a wholesale accounts every day. We have our e-finance team, which works online applications. We get between 500 to 800 online apps a month. That's what they work. New Chevrolet internet sales. If a lead comes in and they've specified a vehicle, and it's a new Chevy, it goes to the new team. If they pick the vehicle and it's a used car, it goes to one of the used teams. We have two used car teams. Our Bell Road, our satellite used car lot, it was originally going to be like a lot of used car lots, just a satellite facility. It's a giant internet sales building now. 85% of the cars they sell come from internet leads. And they're doing 100 to 125 a month. Again, we split the used car team, took one of the best salespeople, well, I shouldn't say one of the best salespeople, one of the salespeople that really demonstrated leadership abilities, promoted him, which motivated everybody else on the team, sent him out there, only poor guy, we didn't give him any salespeople. He had to go out and recruit, interview, hire, took him probably three, four months to get going. We guaranteed his income, we paid him, while he was building that team. And that's why he's still there. And he's one of our superstars. Adrian rocks. I mean, 100, 120 cars a month, used cars a month out of a sled lot on internet leads, not bad. We have our commercial team. If you go to um, courtesyfleet.com, you'll see the website for our commercial team. That used to be part of the new car internet team. Realized, you know, it, it grew, grew, grew. Sort of a different customer. Split them off, put them in another building. Bought a strip mall. Knocked down a bunch of walls and called it the commercial and fleet department. They started off with two people. Now they've got like 35 people. And the commercial and fleet sells 50% of the store's total sales. Let's take a look at how this happened. Okay, start with a little timeline here. August of 05. When I got there, and I don't, um, one thing I'm very sensitive to, if all of us in this room, we're all probably, uh, we're all pretty accomplished in the in internet and CRM, otherwise we wouldn't be here. We all get compliments. We all get people telling us how good we are. One of the things that, and, and I kind of remind myself of this every morning when I get out of bed, don't believe your own publicity too much, okay? Give credit where credit's due. When I got there, they had a hell of, heck of an operation going on. I mean, they were, they were running, they were selling between the BDC and the uh, internet teams, internet team, they were selling, what is that, one set, about 180 units a month. Not bad, right? There's probably a lot of people in this room that like to get to that point. 180 cars out of two teams. So I came on board, one of the, my first things was to make sure I didn't wreck anything that was already working. 
And, uh, and I'm proud to say that my first four months there, I didn't lose a single person that reported to me. I were, and believe me, they all tried to get me to farm, too. Uh, but, but I didn't lose a single one. Um, I changed the pro during this period of time, I changed a lot of their processes because they were doing it the way a lot of stores do it. If you want a price, come down to the store, pounding on the phones, not doing, unless it was automated, not doing an email, too much work, clickety-clack. We changed that. We implemented a process. And it's funny because I go, when you go in there today, everybody looks, nobody thinks twice about responding with a four-car price quote. That's how we do it. Looking up the inventory, picking cars out for customers, making suggestions, finding out what's important to them by email and phone. It all looks so natural. When I first got there, they looked at me, I, Jerry, I know you know my pain. They all looked at me like, are you out of your mind, Paglia? Who the heck do you think you are? We're selling 170 cars a month. You know, you're 180 cars a month, and you're trying to tell us to change our process? Well, we did. We changed it. That was the, probably the most difficult time period since I've been there. Here's what we did from here. We took the BDC, and I took a, a Cisco, who was one of Joel's top producers, and I found a room over in the used car building, more like a closet, put six really tiny cubicles. I can't fit in them, these little tiny cubicles. And uh, we built a used car BDC, focused on bringing traffic in for the used car uh, center that's at our main location. Cisco gets the thing up and running, hires some CSRs, some customer service reps, we call them. Joel had to restock his team because Cisco raided mostly the Spanish speakers off his team. Over on this side, and actually in that, at, that, at this point in time, Tammy Boyd was the internet sales manager. And, and for about a week, I had two internet sales managers, and I was, for the new car, well, it was actually, there was no used car team, but I had two internet sales managers, and we were gonna, and we were gonna, they picked teams, and there were gonna be two teams, and then Tammy self-destructed one day, lost her temper, and quit. So I said, George, you're it, and took Brian Long, who was on the team, who seemed to do nothing but sell a whole bunch of used cars, but he demonstrated a lot of leadership capabilities. I actually don't think of Brian as the best salesperson on the team, but what he really showed was leadership. People went to Brian for help. Uh, he was you know, very thoughtful, very organized. I said, Brian, how would you like to become our internet sales manager of used cars and get paid on the team's production? I want to do that. I want to move into management. So we bring Brian over. There was a row of salesperson offices. Managed to get one of the old timers off the front line to give up his office for Brian. I'm happy to report to you today, the internet team owns every office in the building. The only thing they got is a desk with a tower for the desk managers, the, the, the salespeople off the front line, you know, they have a couple of tables out in the work area that they work off of, but every actual office is now owned by Brian. And you're going to see what Brian built, because this guy right there, that was probably my best horse that I bet on in the two, past two years. This guy took off, you know, like, a triple crown winner. It was unbelievable what Brian did. George Salmon, who I mentioned to you didn't know anything about the internet, he builds a team and this guy rocks. I mean, he gets on the phone, the guys come to him, he works and desks the deal. He's the desk manager, he packages the deals, we send them to the same finance department as the floor uses, but we do not go through the sales tower. And we've wrestled with that whole arrangement. So we're up to December of 05. Fast forward seven months, here's where we're at. Ryan Long is doing about 50 units a month. George is doing 90 units a month with his team. Joel's producing out of the new car BDC 100 sales a month. Cisco's doing about 60 units a month. But I'm starting to notice that as much as I'm trying to supervise Cisco, I can't really get anything done unless I go to Joel, who, is, who hired him originally. So I'm starting to see some dynamics going on here. In the meantime, I got my two administrators down here. Kelly and Ceci. We create the e-finance team. We start noticing that it's pretty easy to get online credit apps. One of the easiest things in the world is to tell people with bad credit, hey, we can get you into a new car and we can help restore your credit. Give us your information. It's like uh, you know, shooting fish in a barrel. It's easy. So we ramp this up to about an average of about 750 credit apps a month. Uh, credit leads are more expensive, 
but they're better, they have a higher closing rate. I have the two twins, Ron and Scott. They're rocking, they're ringing bells back there. I bring them back into the e-business area, which is the former parts department, because the, the Grubel's built a 200,000 square foot, four story mega building that's now the parts department. So I took the old parts department and turned it into the e-business department. BDC, new car sales teams. I knocked down a lot of walls. I lived with the nightmare of working with contractors, trying to build something. Um, so we get the e-finance team going. Ron and Scott, they've got two salespeople that they get an override on. And we, we did something real interesting with this. We took 32% of the gross, and we just gave it to Ron and Scott and said, you can do anything you want with it. You pay your people, you can hire as many people as you want. You got 32% of the gross profit on the sales to work with. You want your own finance manager? No problem, go out and hire one, but it comes out of the 32% for the whole department. We made it truly a, a separate profit center and it, we, we customized our daily doc report to split this off with different GL codes and everything. So they started off at about 35, you'll see where that went. Over here, our first, when, they, when we built the building on Bell Road, they, were, they had been working over there at the, at the used car satellite lot, they've been working on trailers. They built this beautiful building and we installed computers, no traffic. Virtually no, they didn't have a franchise, virtually no traffic. So we, right away we install Patrick, we have a bunch of salespeople that report to Patrick, Patrick handles and routes the leads, matches the leads up to the individual salesperson, follows up, makes sure that uh, they're, they're emailing and calling the customers, holds them accountable. They start rocking, doing you know, like 25 sales a month. Things actually making money, low overhead. So that's where we were, and then we go to the next phase. <clears throat> the parts department had moved out a long time ago. There was this, about 3,000 square feet in the back behind my, what was then my current BDC and my current internet sales team. And one day Scott Gruel takes me back there and he says, we're getting rid of all this junk. It was all racks and old uh, service files. And they had spent a, we spent a year scanning them. We electronically scanned all the old records, 3,000 square feet of storage. Looked like the Library of Congress back there. 50 years of service folders. Um, and we hired a company to come in and we destroyed them. Everything was incinerated, cheaper than uh, shredding and all that. But Scott says to me, he goes, what, do you, what could we do with this space? And uh, Jerry and Brian know exactly what I said. 3,000 square feet, I said, Scott, let me build the Mac Daddy BDC, the biggest, baddest, best BDC in North America. I can do it. Put together a proposal, asked them for 250,000. I'm not saying they laid down, but I'm pretty persistent. Finally got approval on it. You know, I had to do a lot of things. Started working on the floor plan. This is what we ended up with. There was more arguing over this floor plan. Oh my God, there was arguing, arguing, arguing to the point where at one point, I threw back their changes and I said, you know what, Scott and Mark, the two brothers, you want to do it this way, you do it yourself, I'm done with it. And they said, all right, come on, we don't want to mess with this crap. You do it. Go ahead, build it the way you want to build it. So what we did is in this BDC, we, we, have, we have 27 people working back here. You have the BDC manager's office, which by the way, when I built it, I soundproofed it, double layer glass, Staggered studs, I mean, I, I wanted it to be like an isolation chamber inside there, except it's surrounded by glass. Had to make it all double layer glass for the soundproofing, because otherwise the glass becomes like a speaker. Um, but he, it's raised up a little bit. He can see every workstation in the BDC. It's all, all windows, all the way around. Two doors, because there's, the BDC's organized into two teams. Used car team on this side, that's the door that leads to the hallway. On the other side of the hallway is the new car internet department. This door goes to the outside, the street access to 13th Street. Got with the contractors, built it, office furniture people. And I gotta tell you what, it was a challenge getting this done for, and coming in under the 250. Kept running over budget on stuff, but we got it done. So then we finally get it done. Now it's sort of okay. Where do we get the people? So we moved Joel in there. We uh, moved Cisco in over here. Now, only now I say, Cisco, you now report to Joel. Here's your new pay plan. You all know what happened with Cisco then, right? It took about three months from the self-destruct, but a lot of people can't handle what they perceive as a demotion. 
I have a hard time with it. We tried to make it work. Didn't work. We lost this guy. I hate to say that, but he's working for some mortgage company now doing in a mortgage call center. We took one of our top producers over here, put him in this slot, Vernon, big V, little tiny, he's, we, everybody thinks he's Vietnamese, but his family's from Thailand, little tiny guy, he's a terror on the phone. I mean, this guy smiles and dials, doesn't care what the customer says, gets him in. We start recruiting salespeople or uh, customer service reps. Vernon, you gotta train him to do exactly what you do. And then over on the used car side, we went online. I searched resumes. I found myself a guy that was managing a, um, a timeshare call center. Recruited a bunch of them, but I specifically targeted timeshare people. Brought him in, his name's Steve Clemens, hired him around Christmas, this past Christmas. Brought him on board, he's been like a breath of fresh air. I mean, the guy is rocking. For the first time ever, the used car side is out producing deals than the new car side out of our BDC. This BDC, now that we have it filled with people, that produces 250 deals a month. Every day we have two ceiling mounted projectors that project on, on two walls on each side the, uh, the current state of how many outbound calls they've made, how many appointments they've set, how many shows have come in through the front reception desk. My two CRM administrators track the shows, enter them in the computer, they show up on the walls in the BDC. How many deals have been made? So it's like, it's, it's like uh, I got this idea from a more, I visited a mortgage call center in Southern California looking at a phone system, and I saw they had this thing with the projector up on the wall so everybody could see how many calls the other people were making and taking. And I thought, this is great because it creates a little bit of positive competition. You see your name up there and you see where you rank. I like to figure out how to get it to sort. Right now, every name is in the same slot with their numbers. I'm trying to figure a way to have it sort by volume. You know, like a horse race, who's, on, who's in the lead? Uh, and we're working out, but it's a huge motivator, plus we broadcast films and training clips simultaneously. It runs off of Joel's computer in there. It was funny, the night before Brent Dewar showed up, from Brent Dewar's the uh, GM Vice President of Marketing for North America. He was coming to, after this was built, he said, I wanna come see it. So the night before, I mean, we had just got it done, it was last September. It took me nine months, by the way, to build this thing. Um, don't want to do that again. I mean, I would, but I, I, I think I'd do it a little differently as far as the contractors and who you hire. You know, cutting corners and is not always the most effective way to get it done. At any rate, the night before Brent came down, Joel, who's a real thin young man, he's up in the ceiling. I'm feeding him projector cable. This stuff right here, I had to order custom cables, like 52 feet long and stuff. I'm feeding him the cable, he's crawling through, dragging it through the ceiling tile, so, and then we're trying to mount the, 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 L, the, uh, the projectors on the ceiling, you know, you mount them upside down, hang them from the ceiling. The IT guy at 530 said, oh, that's it, I'm done, you're on your own, guys. You know, we're sitting there trying to install dual video cards in his PC and stuff, and I'm looking at Brian and Jerry, because I know you guys have been there. I know you've been there, but we got it done. We got it done. We're there until about 3 o'clock in the morning. 8 a.m., Brent Dewar shows up. Every seat was filled, the projector was going on, and, uh, and we were off to the races. Here's a picture, some pictures. It's a little jumbled, I tried to cram a bunch of pictures in there, but that's our, that's our BDC. You can see where the projector shines on the wall on two sides. That's the opening on the lower right corner, the opening from the new to the used. You get the same shot, just a different angle here. And the way the BDC is designed on that floor plan is the workstations are laid out by what areas they specialize in. The four along this wall on each side, those four work on internet leads. The internet leads that go to the BDC are the ones that don't pick a car. The ones that are trying to win a free, you know, $500 worth of gas or, you know, we have all these crazy contests. We have, you know, we have a website on the future Camaro, things like that. Um, we uh, get a free oil change, fill out this survey, get a free oil change. That type of lead goes to the BDC. The only leads that go to the internet sales team are the ones where a customer says, that's the car I want, what can you do? So that brings us to September of 06, it's past September. <clears throat> we merged the used car and new car BDC into the one room. Cisco and Vernon were both reporting to Joel. Uh, Brian's rocking along, he's up to 75 sales. George is hitting about a buck and a quarter a month. Adrian, I replaced Pat, He's kind of imploded out at uh, Bell Road. So I took one of, my, one of the guys that worked for George, who'd been there for four years. Adrian, you want a promotion? And this guy was, this Adrian was selling eight cars a month. <clears throat> 
eight cars a month. I figured out after a while that's what he needed to sell to pay his rent and buy enough beer. And, uh, and he was just in that rut. I mean, he could have been selling 16, but he was selling eight. And, I, and it was, as Scott made the recommendation to me, Scott Grewell goes, did you consider Adrian? I'm like, Adrian? And I'm thinking, you know, he kind of, he's back there like the peanut gallery, throwing out these weird comments, selling eight cars a month, but he's rock steady, reliable. He knows the business. We're going to promote this guy. Sent him out to Bell Road. I've never regretted it. He doubled the sales overnight. He, last month, he did 72 units off of internet leads at Bell Road. Obviously, he's got salespeople that he works them with. Brings us to the point where we are in January of 07, the team structure, a couple names changed. And here we are today. Our latest project that we started March 1 is we took another ASM off the floor, put him, knocked down some more walls, added some more workstations. Basically, what I was able to do is knock down the wall between the new car internet department and the old BDC and put on five more offices for internet sales specialists. Then I took up front and commandeered another four offices, and we took Mike Funk off the floor, knows nothing about the, you ought to see this guy on our computer. Where's the queue? What's that? That's a mouse, Mike. But he's learning. Son of a gun's handling leads. And here, what is it, March 14th or something, two weeks into it? Guy's learning. He's been selling cars for 26 years. ASM, floor manager, he's now growing his team. Our goal is to, t is to split the new car team into two teams that are organic growth I was talking about, get them consistently over 140 new a month. Brian's rocking, he's got the best, thing, best sales volume ever, over 100 units. We took the e-finance team, which got a little expensive, took the twins, made one of them the new car floor manager, one of them the used car floor manager, had Brian recruit a couple special finance guys. We folded the e-finance team into, under Brian's leadership. Uh, he took over their office space and the leads. We cut the expenses, some of the advertising expenses. We were doing a lot of outdoor. We, we lost, they were, the e-finance team was averaging about 50 units a month. We lost about half the units but kept the 25 most profitable parts of the deal. So now Brian's over 100 units a month consistently and that's where we are today. I know we're out of time, we're going to be running out of time but there's a couple of things I really wanted to go over with all of you. A couple recommendations. Number one, when you get back to the dealership, start with your job, do a job description. Document if you don't hire before you have a job description, a written job description. I cannot tell you the quality of the people I've been able to attract from other industries because they have a written job description they take home with them, show their wives or, or husbands, and we talk about it and they ask me questions, they come back, they got things circled, Notes and stuff, well, what does this mean? What's this part of the job? This started off as a one-page one document. Every time we think of something they need to do, I tell George, Mike Funk, Brian, all the managers that work for me, you cannot hold your people accountable for anything that's not in this job description. And I mean everything's in here. Showing up for work on time, dressing appropriately. You know, we, there's stuff that, that comes right out of the employee manual, the employee manual, but this is the job description for an internet sales specialist, including URLs to websites we own that they must be familiar with, which is great for recruiting. They take it home, or I email it to them, and they click on the links, and they start seeing all our various microsites and all the creative stuff we're doing. And I've had some people that never sold cars before. I got one guy, he's from Scotland, he's got this charming Scottish accent, he was a, like a brass buyer for some manufacturing plant that left town. He didn't want to move to Denver where they moved to. So he saw the ad on Java.com. He comes in, I give him the job description, looks at all these websites, comes back and says, he's laughing. He goes, oh my God, what you, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't understand what he was saying. You know, he's Scottish. But I said, it might work well on the phone. And uh, so we hired him. He's, he, the last two months, he's been our number one producer. Now he was hired in December of 05. He started you know, like the last half, so he's been with us just a little over a year. But here's a guy who never sold cars before in his life, but he knows how to negotiate because he was a purchasing agent who's so always negotiating. And the customers love him. He's got sky-high CSI. And I'm telling you, I would not have this guy if it wasn't for this document. Okay, so the, that Paul Cross and himself is worth the work that went into this document. And there's many other stories behind that. The other thing I like to do is when we have heat cases, you know, a customer buys a car, becomes a heat case. 
at some point in the process of resolving the heat, because eventually they end up in front of me. My job is to prevent them from getting to the grew wells. Um, I like to offer them a job. I always find that diffuses the heat. You know, you're awesome. I cannot believe how just assertive you are about getting what's right, what we owe you. Would you be interested in working for us? Because we need people like you. It's great. I've hired a few people like that. Um, and it sure fades the heat quick. Um, oh, wait a second. Back up. That's a pay plan. Have your pay plan in writing. When you hire somebody, they sign the pay plan. I ran out of room, so now I just have them sign across the edge. And, um, and then make sure they get paid. We've automated this. Yes? Mr. Gruwell will not let me adjust pay plans unless it's once a year. If I want to adjust a pay plan, and I've done it twice now, um, I have to start in about November, and it'll go into effect January 1st, and the current employees are offered the opportunity to stay on the old pay plan exactly as it was. The new pay plan is only effective to the new employees. Now, I'm here to tell you that it took a couple of my core guys that were there a while ago, took them about a year to figure this out, but they're, most of them are starting to switch to the new pay plan with the, with the variable commission percentages because they've realized if you sell, the way we designed it is if you sell 12 or more cars, you make a lot more money. If you sell less than 12 cars, the new pay plan pays less than the old pay plan. Because the problem I had is, you know, guys would do, they, they'd put down a couple of Corvettes, generate 20,000 in gross, and that was it. They were done. They were on vacation for the rest of the month because our former pay plan was a straight 25% of the gross. No pack, no hold back. I got paid on everything. And uh, so I took that same 25% and just adjusted it. I skewed at 12 cars and above, we hit about a 30% payout. At 12 cars or less, we're down around 15%. So the whole department still runs at about 25%, but my top producers make big money. Uh, last year, the, our internet sales specialist, the average for over 40 people was 77,000. I had five guys go over 110,000. I, that, you know, I know that's, a lot of people go, oh, that's, that's not that much money, but um, I've been in a lot of stores. I'm not embarrassed by that income. My BDC manager, Joel, last year in his pay plan, which again, I had a change going into the, because we grew the BDC, he made 170000 last year. Unbelievable. I, never, I got told him, I go, you are the highest paid BDC manager in America. If anybody knows of a BDC manager who made more than 170 last year, I want to know about it because he doesn't believe me, and I told him, I guarantee you, you're the highest paid BDC manager in America. Um, this is where the staff all comes into effect. Customer goes online, submits a lead. Internet sales special reviews the lead. Four vehicles, does the price quotes. Da, 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 da. The process they all, they all said was crap. They all now do. The BDC staff makes the initial phone call because these guys are too busy. They, they skim off the easy appointments. If they can't get the appointment, they go to the ISS or they put notes in, in our BuzzTrack CRM tool, and then the ISS works on, on trying to get the appointment. This is our process map. The process map is used for training. Yes, sir. Can I have two minutes to wrap it up? Thank you. Process maps. Map out your processes. Define them. All your letters and templates put index numbers. We index them all. Otherwise, nobody can figure out what you meant by the first response email because you got 15 versions of it. So we, um, everything is indexed. Everything's numbered and in our CRM tool on BuzzTrack, it's all numbered and it flows according to the way you're most likely to use them, top to bottom. Again, this is the bottom part of the process map. We create two separate process channels. One is email, one is phone. They run simultaneously. The reason why we do this is um, we typically go to the BDC for most of the phone work. The internet sales people do, do it too, but um, uh, you know, when they're running on all eight cylinders, they're busy uh, demoing cars and delivering cars. So that's where the BDC picks up the slack on the phone work. Everybody says, follow up till they buy or die. That's a myth, can't be done. We get over 5,000 leads a month. I can't hire enough people. I, it would take me 300 salespeople to follow up until they buy or die. And even then, I, I, I might have a problem. So what we do is that on the 45th day, if they haven't got an appointment, we put it into a, what's called a dormant status. From there, the BDC, we do a lot of automated stuff, a lot of data mining. Uh, we do use some outsourced vendors. We use IMN for our monthly newsletters. Um, I was really impressed by, uh, um, uh, what was it? The guy that does the email campaigns at a workshop yesterday in Salon C. I was really impressed. We're going we're to look into that. No, no, no. It's like auto. What is it? 
Auto revenue, auto revenue. I don't want to talk to that guy because I'm fascinated by, I have 250,000 customers in our DMS database. I, and he can do an, a pen where they import, they find the email addresses for about 25%. Uh, process scoring, this is how our internet salespeople are evaluated for raises and bonuses. It's on a very objective, in writing basis. They all know what it is. The phone, we all know this already. The phone is where it's at. And that's it. Questions? I think